Well, welcome everyone um, to the Art of Podcasting. I'm going to admit some people as I'm talking, do a little intro. Um, glad you're all here. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Nina Pollock, and I work with Building Beats. Um, if you guys don't know, Building Beats is a nonprofit organization based in New York, uh, providing music and podcasting education to the youth of New York and LA. Uh, the Art of Podcasting is a collaboration with New York Music Month Extended Play, which is an initiative of the Mayor's Office of uh, Media and Entertainment. Uh, through the New York Music Month Extended Play Initiative, we will be offering uh, free music production and podcasting workshops through May 2021. Um, so be sure to check out all the amazing lineup of workshops on our site. Um, I will drop some links in the chat box so you can reference those. Um, today's workshop is the final touches. And uh, during this workshop, you'll learn basically how to um, bring life to your podcast through sound design. And your teaching artist will be Jeremy S. Bloom, um, who's an Emmy-nominated sound designer whose work spans across podcasts, film, TV, immersive exhibits, and theater. So he knows what he's talking about. Um, the world soundscapes constantly respond to their surroundings and inhabitants. Uh, Jeremy's designs recreate these dynamic reactions with careful research and craft. So this is going to be a really fantastic workshop. Um, if you guys have any questions or have any tech issues, please feel free to send me a private chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the entire workshop. Um, if you have any questions, we'll want to save most of them for the end, unless it's immediate, you know, question you want to ask Jeremy about something specific that he just mentioned. Um, you just want to clarify something real quick. So just shoot a message in the chat. We'll try to get your questions answered. Um, but if not, he's going to save some time at the end uh, to answer any other questions you might have. Um, so enjoy the workshop. I will officially hand off uh, to Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. And thanks so much for having me. I love um, you know, uh, the sort of musical scene in New York City. And actually, for many years, I used to busk in the subways of New York City under uh, another program under the mayor's office. It was cool to like continuously engage with various city music programs. Um, I'm going to share my screen real fast. Go. And I am going to pull up the chat so I can see all. You know, I, I love this. Um, the last talk I gave was on a different platform that wasn't Zoom, and I couldn't see anyone. And it was like very disorienting, just like speaking into this ether. So it's cool that I can see some of you. That's super awesome. All right. Um, So I love to cook. I, I love cooking. Um, growing up, I'd get home from school and the kitchen was kind of this, um, it was like a social nexus of our home. So every, every family would just always gather in the kitchen. So I'd come home, uh, I'd unpack my book bag, I'd dump all my books on the kitchen counter and I'd start doing my homework. And meanwhile, my mother would start cooking dinner. And that's how I was sort of exposed to cooking for many years. I would sort of um, I don't know if it was through the smell or just through sitting there, but I sort of absorbed a lot of my mom's um, amazing passion for cooking. And she, she made excellent meals for us. And it was just sort of a central part of our household. And I got to college and the, the cafeteria didn't really offer exactly that same experience. The food wasn't, wasn't that home cooked stuff that I was accustomed to. Um, and that just the overall vibe was different. So I made friends with the cafeteria staff at my college and um, they would sneak me ingredients out of the pantry. I'm sure it was not allowed at all. They'd sneak me ingredients and I taught myself how to cook uh, with this sort of, sort, of, sort of gray market ingredients from the, the college cafeteria staff um, and began a sort of lifelong cooking, uh, cooking passion. I, I love to cook. Um, now, you might ask, Jeremy, like, I came here to learn how to sound design my podcast. Why are you blabbing on and on about cooking? Why are you in your kitchen? What's going on? And for me, they're, they're the exact same thing. Sound designing a podcast or sound designing any story and cooking are their mirror images of each other. They're both about how you can curate ingredients, combine them, process them, mix them together, taste a little bit, adjust. Maybe you add a little secret sauce that only you know about. And ultimately, uh, you're transforming these components into a sort of entirely new experience uh, that's consumed by your audience 
and they leave the feeling the they leave the table ideally uh, feeling satisfied. And um, the other thing that I just love about both of them is that they're both just totally infinite in possibilities in terms of there's there's always more to learn. There's always new um, skills to develop, new things to explore, um, and so on. Now, the one thing is when I say that sound design and cooking are sort of the same thing or mirror images, I should clarify what I mean by sound design. So many people use that term in so many different ways. So for me, and for any sound designer you ask, it's going to be totally different. They're going to give you a different answer. But for me, sound design is all about this intersection between, you know, first there's the Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. So for me, sound design is all about um, just making informed choices to further a story with sound. So in this case, uh, your podcast, it's making tons of choices, usually, usually hundreds of little, little choices that are all about taking the story that you want to tell and using the sound of your podcast to support that story and tell in the best way possible. That might mean choosing music, that might mean adding sound effects, that might mean um, going out and recording the world, it might mean uh, choosing how fast or slow the dialogue is, it, it can be anything, but it's about making those choices in an informed and kind of conscious way. And to do that, um, first, you, you, you need the technique to actually execute those choices. So you need some knowledge of audio editing, how to chop up audio and rearrange it, mixing, how to sort of uh, manipulate its qualities and its volume so it all sits together nicely, the recording arts, how you can actually collect sound, um, perhaps synthesis, creating sounds totally from scratch, from electronics, um, for, for some projects, a sort of sense of forensic restoration, so the ability to take old recordings and make them uh, more intelligible, perhaps. Um, maybe sound engineering or, or sound systems, like maybe you're in a situation where you need to understand the technology that's involved in delivering your sound to other people. So that's sort of off in one corner. There is composition, and I mean this in a way broader term than, than kind of your standard understanding of musical composition. It's not only, um, it's not only organizing cellos and basses and drums and deciding what's playing when, when, but a totally exploded understanding of just sounds in general, how you can organize them, how they can fit together um, and be organized together, how they can have a sense of pacing, how they can occur over time in different speeds and a sense of curation, knowing sort of what sounds to choose when in order to, to further that story. And then finally, last but not least at all, um, is a sense of storytelling. Sound design also, uh, you know, you're, you're making informed choices to further a story with sound. And so in order to do that, you have to understand how to tell a story. Um, so that might mean uh, having a kind of creative vision. So a foresight for how you want your story to be told. Um, a sense of collaboration, being able to work with other people to tell that story. Direction, um, being able to communicate your vision of the story to other people. And uh, something that's deeply important to me and I consider it to be a huge part of the job of a sound designer is a sense of translation, being able to discuss how, um, how you'll use sound to convey a story without necessarily having to lean on all sorts of unapproachable technical jargon. You wanna be able to have a human conversation with other people about what uh, you want your sounds to make people feel. And for me, Sound design is sort of the intersection of all, all these things. Um, and for every project and every person, there's maybe a little more of this, a little more than that, but uh, sound design is where they all come together. So with all that in mind, how can we think about cooking and lessons from the kitchen and apply it to great sound design? Ultimately, cooking is the exact same thing. You need great technique. You need to know how to use your knife. You need to know how to apply heat to your food, how to season it. Um, maybe you need some pastry skills, uh, food safety. You don't want people to throw up uh, when they're eating your meal. You need a sense of composition, how the food is assembled on the plate, what it pairs with, uh, how you might plan your menu, maybe a sense of certain cuisines from around the world or a sense of seasonality, what suits each season. And 
key to great cooking, I think, is storytelling. You know, your food, in my mind, the, the best purpose it can serve is to gather people around the table to sort of facilitate conversation and relationships. Um, so, yeah. So what, what can we learn from cooking that we can apply to sound design? So when I was thinking about this and when I was thinking about the things that I wanted to share with you, um, I thought, uh, what would be better than to go into my kitchen, my favorite, favorite place in, in the world, and think about lessons from here that I think truly uh, will make the sound design of your podcast or any, honestly, any, any kind of sound design project, whether it be film or theater or video game sound design or art, whatever it is, uh, make it really sing. That, um, the first lesson from the kitchen for me is uh, before you even start making anything, I think it's really important to taste the world. The, the meals you cook benefit from the meals you eat. And so it's really important if you want to strive to always be a better cook, to expose yourself to as many different kinds of foods and as many meals as possible. Because uh, ultimately your work in the kitchen will draw from every experience you've had out in the world consuming food. So whether it's that $2 taco you had a bar on Saturday night, uh, it might be the, the little chocolate dessert that you had on that terrible first date. It might be some fancy restaurant that your rich uncle took you to for your birthday. Company potluck, do doesn't matter. Doesn't Honestly, it doesn't even matter if those are good meals or bad meals, you still learn from them. And so with that, I would just encourage you to listen to the world. Um, and that means not only listening to other podcasts, of course, but watch movies. Um, listen, how does the sound in a movie further the story? Um, go on a hike maybe, and how do the birds react to your presence in the forest? How um, how do they sound different after a rainstorm rather than before? Um, listen to the sound of your own voice in a room. So how does the room influence the character of your voice? Does your voice sound different in your bathroom than it does in your bedroom? Um, just today, um, or actually yesterday, I realized that the sound of a full wine glass clinking is totally different than an empty wine glass clink clinking. They're absolutely two entirely different sounds. So just listen to the world around you. And if you want to take this even further, there's this amazing resource that I love that is free. It's my favorite. I love this. Um, and it's called a sound education. And the author R. Murray Schaefer invented the word soundscape. He was the first person to coin that word. And it is a list of a hundred exercises. You don't need a microphone, you don't need a computer, you don't need anything. All you need is your ears and a notepad. And so 100 exercises to go through the world and, um, and listen to it and become a better listener. And ultimately, if you're looking to use sound to help further the stories that you're trying to tell, the best thing that you can do is sort of actively go out in the world and listen. And um, whether you do that on your own or you do that with uh, sort of a series of prompts like these ones, um, you'll be an infinitely better sound designer by doing that. And it's something that it's a lifelong, it's a lifelong learning. And then if we think about our sound design as a meal, of course, the very first thing that we need to think about is where do we get our ingredients? Where do we, where do we go shopping for ingredients? And so um, like in cooking, I think for sound design, where you choose to get your ingredients can completely depend on what you're trying to make, what kind of meal you're trying to make, and the needs that you're trying to serve in that moment. So there may be times that um, the equivalent of a frozen meal from your freezer is perfect. So for instance, uh, around this time, I would normally be cooking dinner. Tonight, I'm super happy and ecstatic to be uh, speaking with all of you. And so I'm probably going to be kind of tired after this. I'm not going to want to cook dinner as much as I love cooking. And so I have some stuff that's frozen. I'm going to grab it and I can feed myself quickly and efficiently and it'll taste good. It might not be the greatest thing in the world, but I get food in my stomach. And sometimes that's what you need uh, when you're sound designing your podcast too. Maybe it's due in an hour, you don't have time to um, you know, write in a concerto under it and you just need something that's going, going to work. And so there are a number of sort of stock music sites, stock sound effect sites um, that cater mainly towards video production but also serve that purpose. So there are big stock music sites like Pond5, Shutterstock, Musicbed, uh, the Free Music Archive, which is a resource of publicly available 
free music. And um, sometimes that's perfect. Sometimes that, that serves exactly what you need. You find the, the underscore you want, whether it's sort of uh, natural sounds or music, musical sounds, and, and you're good to go. Um, but there are other times that you maybe want to get a little more in depth. You want to get a lot of basics at once. Maybe you don't know exactly uh, what you need, but you want to browse and find some really dependable in ingredients to try out. Um, so that's like going to your, your really dependable, trustworthy neighborhood grocery store to find inspiration for the meal that you want to cook tonight. And there are uh, music libraries like um, APM is one that I use sometimes, or there are also sound effect sites like soundsnap.com. They're really great for this. Um, some of them even work on a subscription model. And it's sort of like, it's a big department store. You go in, there are different categories you can browse. You can maybe, maybe you start looking for one thing and then you see in another aisle over there, oh, there's maybe something that would work. And so that's also a great sort of, um, a great resource. Um, but of course, then sometimes you need something special. You want a special ingredient, maybe something that's in season, uh, something that is fresh. Um, and so you would go to the farmer's market. And there are um, a number of sound designers and composers and sort of online market places. They're sort of the equivalent of, uh, they're kind of like boutique independent growers. They put a lot of time into a limited selection of really high quality ingredients. So there are places like Marmoset Music, which is a, a music library that um, works with musicians who aren't necessarily um, writing music for commercial underscore purposes. They're like working artists, working composers, working um, uh, bands, um, and the site curates them and makes them available for use. Or there's also a website for sound effects called asoundeffect.com, which is a boutique um, that puts out sort of, it's a marketplace where independent sound designers like myself can put out um, specialty libraries. Perhaps you're doing a project that's all about penguins. And so you need some great penguin sounds. So maybe there's some sound designer out there who recorded some penguins. So you don't need to go to Antarctica. You can find them there. Um, yes, and it is uh, Mar there, there, we'll be distributing a list of these after, but it's marmoset music like that, like the animal. Um, but that kind of brings us to my, my very favorite way of sourcing ingredients for a sound design. Um, these are some hen of the woods mushrooms that I found in the forest with my friend. And I find that finding your own ingredients or foraging for your own ingredients, it tends to make the most meaningful meal. Um, not only is it delicious, it's fresh, it's nutritious, but also there's something just sort of very special about it. Um, more, kind of more love goes into it. Um, and so I think foraging for your sounds is the absolute number one best thing um, if you have the time on a project that will make you a, a way better sound designer. And that's not only because you have a story to tell with it and not only because it's going to be really great, but also um, because as you're collecting the sounds, it's also forcing you to listen to the world in a way that you can continue to notice things about the way that sound in the world works. So you can go out into the world. And so um, perhaps you have a recorder like this or like this, which is like a zoom or something like that, that can help you collect sounds um, from your environment or from traveling. But the truth is right now, everybody has a microphone in their pocket and you can get, you can get away with a lot with this. There are, you, you'd be amazed. Like if you just need to, you're you know, walking in the park and hear something really cool and notice it, like go ahead, record it. It will be useful. Um, I guarantee it. And it will make you a better listener, a better sound designer. and um, fun and yeah, can't, can't recommend it more highly. The next lesson from the kitchen is this concept called uh, mise en place. And it's a French term. It means everything in its place. And from what I'm, from what I'm told, um, it's the very first thing that you learn in culinary school on day one. I haven't been to culinary school, but everything I've read, all my friends who've been like that is lesson number one. You show up, you put on your chef's hat, put on your apron, and before you even pull out a knife or anything like that, it's all about mise en place. And it's this um, concept that you're more efficient in the kitchen, you cook a better meal if you get all your ingredients situated ahead of time, just where you need them, they have a dedicated spot, and then you don't need to worry about you know, the, 
your steak burning on the stove while you're trying to cut an onion and the brownies are, are lit on fire in the fridge because everything, everything's in its place, it's ready to go and you can sort of focus on one thing at a time. And so I'm not a particularly organized person. And when I started off my sound sessions for podcasts or for whatever else I might be doing, they looked something like this. The, the kitchen was a mess. Um, and so can you, cook a, a, can you cook a meal in a super messy kitchen? Of course you can, but it's going to be way harder. There are way more kind of barriers to getting your job done. Yeah, it's hard to find stuff. Stuff is burning on the stove. You're juggling a hundred things. And it's just, um, it, it ultimately impacts the quality of the meal that you're making. And so oftentimes I see sessions that look like this. And so this is an example of a session in Pro Tools, but that, that doesn't really matter. The point is, it's just not, it's not organized. It's hard to see your work, to know where things are. Uh, you'll see the, the tracks aren't labeled in a way that makes sense. This thing, that thing, audio, new, use me, final, version eight, duplicate. Um, for some reason, scene four comes after scene five. Um, the clips are kind of all over the place. There's all this stray volume stuff. And it's just sort of like, you have to dig through a lot to understand what's going on. And so, I, I think a thing that people maybe underrate, but is just a key in doing really, really great work, and it doesn't take that much extra time, is just being really conscious about the way that you organize your work. So I, I don't care if you're using Pro Tools or magnetic tape, it doesn't matter, but just taking the five minutes that it takes to get a little bit organized. So you'll see everything here has a consistent color. The tracks are labeled in a way that makes sense. The, the kind of adage is if I were, to get hit by a bus tomorrow. Like I wanna be able to hand this work off to somebody else and they can open it, open it, and they can immediately understand it. But it benefits me too, because I can look at this, I know where everything is. And so I can really think about my ideas instead of trying to find stuff. You'll see um, tracks are labeled and so forth. Um, beyond that, another thing that I really like about this is that it allows you to kind of, if you sort of take a step back, if you zoom out on the whole thing, can really give you a sense of the storytelling structure of your piece. You can see where all the music lines up. You might see that there's more music towards the beginning of the piece than the end of the piece. You can see who's talking more than other people. Um, so it's just like, it takes five minutes and it really, I, I guarantee you, makes everything sound way, way better. So things like color coding, things like checkerboarding, which you'll see on the top of the session here. Um, you'll see the host and the reporter in this case, this is maybe a more journalism oriented piece, but, or maybe it's one actor and another actor, you'll see they kind of switch between each other on tracks. So they kind of alternate um, a, a sense of cascading. So you can see the blue tracks in the middle. If we imagine those are sound effects, they kind of occur and they, they go down one track by time. So I can really see the order of things as they occur. Um, clear labels. I can see there's a track for my host, there's a track for a reporter, there's a track for each of my guests, sound effects, music, and so forth. Um, makes it sound way better, I promise. But it's not to say that you should get too organized too early. So we're talking mise en place sort of serves to organize your meal, but let's talk about the pantry for a second. Um, I personally like my pantry organized enough that I know where to find all my ingredients, but I also, and maybe you can see this behind me. I like a little bit of chaos because um, I, I find that in that chaos, there can be kernels of inspiration and, it, and discovery that it kind of promotes. So um, and a good example is the other day, uh, maybe a few months ago, I was making a focaccia. And you can see back here, I keep, um, I keep olive oil, canola oil, and fish sauce up on that shelf there. And they're all in the same bottle. They all look like this. And I wasn't thinking, I was tired and I was making my focaccia dough. And I, I grabbed the bottle of olive oil and I poured it in. And then I realized I poured in the fish sauce into my focaccia dough, which is something that I would never in a hundred years think of or want to do ever. But I didn't want the food to go to waste. So I threw it in the oven and it came out pretty good. Like it, it wasn't bad. And I made a discovery through it. And I, I like to think the same way with my sound. So um, you know, if, if things are just messy enough that I have to look a little bit through them, I have to dig a little bit, it's, um, maybe I'll make discoveries along the way that I never would have thought of. I'm, I'm like, I don't know, I'm not that smart. Like, I'm not going to think of this really like 
out of field left thing. But if I have to explore a little, maybe it will present itself to me. It's like, you can't find the treasure unless you get a little dirty digging through the dirt. Um, this one is super important, uh, which is the best knife doesn't make the best meal. So you can have all the fancy kitchen gadgets in the world. You can have a sous vide machine. You can have um, Instapot. You can have the latest, greatest gadget from uh, Sharper Image. 20 fancy Japanese knives that you personally imported from a master who's been doing it, his family's been doing it for 2,000 years. And it, none of that is going to make you a good chef. And in audio production, audio engineering, sound design, um, there tends to be a little bit of a fixation on gear, a fetishization of um, all the toys, because it's really fun. There are all these knobs to turn. Um, but don't let that distract you. You know, you don't need, you know, getting that one fancy thing is not going to make you a better sound designer. You just need a few tools. You need to get really comfortable with using them. Um, if, if we wanted to get granular with it, like I think you need an EQ, maybe you need a reverb, uh, you need a way to change the pitch of things and you could make, uh, you can make an Oscar, Oscar award-winning sound design with those three things. And those three things come with every audio program that uh, Lloyd Brooks plays, I know. So don't, don't get distracted by the toys. So you started cooking your meal, um, but you can't like when you, so you're like cooking a meal and we can think about what we want to eat. We can sort of choose a recipe, we can describe it. Um, but as much as we talk about it, the language doesn't always capture the nuances of its taste. And you, you'll see in many recipes, it's like season to taste, or um, so you can't necessarily anticipate the needs of a recipe until you get started making it. And so until we like start cooking, we won't know its exact nature and we won't really know all the things that we need to do to make it shine, how much salt to add and when and that sort of thing. And so sometimes I see folks, um, they get really overwhelmed and I do too. We get overwhelmed by all the ideas that we have floating in our head and we just don't know where to start and we procrastinate. And, and the key is, you know, it's called audio editing um, for a reason. And that's something that a great sound designer named Tim Nielsen uh, said that I, I always remember in that like, all you have to do is just get started. You need to throw some ideas down on the page and it doesn't matter if they're good or bad, but it gives you something to respond to at the very least. And then you hone from there and then you listen critically. You're like, oh, that's too loud. I'll turn it down. Uh, I don't think that idea is really working. Why? Oh, maybe I need to remove this and this, or maybe it needs that. And so the, the number one thing that you can do to get a successful sound design started is just start making it. It doesn't matter. Like it, you just need some, some kernel of something practical to start with. Um, finally, um, what is a meal without plating? So a plate is composed of many, many things, but um, really good plating can also have blank space as well, you, you know, a good plate of food is not, it's not piled sky, I mean, I think <laughs> it's not piled sky high. There can be a little space to breathe. And um, I think silence as a sound designer is one of the most powerful choices we have. If, if I go back to that the original sort of understanding of what sound design is, and if we think of it as making informed, making informed choices to further a story, Making the informed choice to do nothing or to, to use silence um, is one of the most powerful tools we have. So that can be silences in between, it can be si silences underneath. And as long as you're sort of thinking about and have a, a reason to justify um, why you're using it, I think it, it's, we're often like obligated to add and add and add and add and add. Um, but you know, silence is a very, very valid and important tool on our, on our palette for, of sounds that we can use. One thing, you know, going back to the previous example, one thing that I really like to do when I get stuck and I run out of ideas and I run out of what, oh, what do I need to add to this? Is I, I like to sometimes invert my thinking and thinking about, okay, 
what can I remove from this to really highlight an idea? So in the same way that you might add music or add a sound when you're trying to make a really important point uh, in the story, what if you invert that? And what if all the sound has established and it goes away when that point is made? So sometimes when I get stuck, I try to sort of look for the negative spaces, if you will. Um, so those are my lessons. Um, I think the, the key thing and the thing when I was thinking about it that I just love the very, very most about cooking and sound design that I, I don't want to overlook is the act of collaboration in that uh, cooking or sharing a meal with another person. It's like, it's one of the most, I think one of the most intimate, uh, meaningful human interactions you can have. And so as you embark on making your meals or doing, doing your sound designs, I think you'll find it to be um, the most satisfying and sort of the most um, fulfilling process if you bring other people into your kitchen. So, you know, collaborating with folks who might have complementary skills to you or being generous with the folks that you might be working with um, who maybe ne aren't necessarily sound designers, but, you know, bring them into, the, into your kitchen. Let them, you know, let them cook a little with you. And for me, you know, projects have beginnings and ends and whatnot, but it's those relationships that really um, keep me going in this job and what, what I really, really, really love about it. Um, so with that, I will take your questions because, um, yeah, we can take the conversation wherever you, wherever you would like to. Cool, that was awesome. That was Thank you. one of the best analogies <laughs> I've heard yet. So I love it. Just for fun, what is the wildest sound you've ever recorded yourself? Oh, um, I, so I was um, doing a presentation much like this in New Jersey, back when we did presentations in person. I was driving home, it was late at night. I was driving through Staten Island um, and I stopped at a pier to record. And there was this really weird eerie whistling sound, uh, like a horror movie. I don't know how to describe it. And um, I loved it and I recorded it, but I couldn't figure out what it was at all. And like 15 minutes into it, um, there were these two fishermen at the end of the pier and I realized it was the sound of the, the wind um, being kind of split by their fishing lines. And so it was, it was whistling in the air and they were like, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And they were so over it. They were like, yeah, and, <laughs> and it, but it is very, very cool. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I also had an opportunity to go out and record all the bell buoys out in New York Harbor, which was amazing. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Um, all right, so we have one question. I heard Koala is great for sampling on my iPad Pro. Are there any options that can help organize different sounds? Gotcha. So I am not familiar with Koala, but I have no doubt that's awesome. And I am going to check it out immediately after this. Um, I, can't, I can't speak to any sort of like specific um, tools on the iPad um, for organizing sounds, but what I, I can share is a sort of bigger mentality that I think might help you, which is um, finding a really consistent uh, naming strategy that makes sense to you. So it could be anything. So um, perhaps breaking your sounds down into different categories or a hierarchy of categories and always labeling them in the same way so that you can find them quickly if you need to. So perhaps if you're sampling, maybe you're making beats from uh, your pots and pans. So maybe um, maybe your files always say uh, Nina underscore uh, kitchen underscore pot one low. And then maybe it's Mina bathroom toothbrush start. I don't know. But just whatever makes sense to you, it, it almost doesn't matter what it is, but as long as it's consistent, and then you can sort of look through alphabetically and find things very quickly. I will mention if you want to take that way, way further, there's this really cool initiative called um, the Universal Category System, which seeks um, to kind of solve the problem that all, every sound designer around the world has their own naming strategy that's sort of like a tunnel into their mind and makes total sense to them and zero sense to anybody else. So it kind of is um, attempting to act as a common, a kind of common language 
between folks. So that way you can pass sounds back and forth and you don't need to spend, it, it's quite time consuming kind of relabeling everything to other people. So it's, it can lead to be a kind of common language. Cool. Yeah, that's super helpful. Yeah, the emphasis on the organization is awesome because that, that can be so make or break with yeah. so many projects. You can see yeah. my stock drawer. Like I am not oh, I'm sure. <laughs> it really helps in this work too. Right. Cool. Well, we got a couple other questions in here. So let me just go ahead and read through them. When planning for a brand new show or series, how do you consider mapping out a sound design there yeah. to communicate with your collaborators? Yeah. So the, the key part of that question is communicating with your collaborators. I, and I think you're sort of, um, you're alluding to something that I think about a lot, which is that sound has this incredible power to convey really, really nuanced emotions that we can't necessarily express in language. But the flip side to that is it's really hard to talk about sound using language. Um, you know, and it, that's just the trade-off that you get that is sort of payment for that nuance, if you will. So what can happen is maybe you're you're speaking with your collaborators and they say, we want our podcast to sound really nostalgic. And you say, great. Um, but their, their idea of what nostalgic sounds are might be totally, totally different than yours. And you need to find a way to make sure that you're kind of talking about the same thing. So um, to answer your question, what I often do when I'm, when I'm starting on a brand new project or show or series or museum exhibit or whatever it might be, is we sort of have an initial conversation. We focus on what they want their show to feel like, what they want the audience to come away feeling. Maybe they say nostalgic. I say, great. And then I come back to them with um, a collection of, uh, it's not big, it's like a collection of maybe six audio examples. Maybe some of it's music, maybe some of it is um, sounds that I've recorded in the world. Uh, maybe some of it is, are examples from other shows, from movies, from whatever it might be. But they all represent, in my mind, I, I work really hard to try to make sure that they represent sort of the extremes of all the different axes that we might consider to be nostalgic. I, I tried to put myself in as many shoes as possible. And then we gather around these examples. We're not auditioning them. So we're not saying, okay, this one's going to go in the show. That one's not going to go in the show. But instead they say, oh, we want our show to sound nostalgic. And I can say, oh, nostalgic like this. And they go, not quite like that, but there's there's something about that one that that is getting at what I have in mind. Um, I, I don't know if this part of it exactly fits that, but like I love the kind of um, the instruments or whatever it might be. And it, you can kind of use that to dissect the different qualities and then have a common language, a common understanding of what you're trying to do. So that way, when you go to make up your own thing, you can go back to those references. It can inform your own work. And then finally, if especially if it's like a kind of commercial relationship with client and designer, Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But then when you have to circle back around two months later and they totally forget all the conversations that you've had, you can play those examples again and you can say, hey, if you remember, like we played this, this, and that, and you love this about this, and you love this about that, and we listened to this example, and we didn't really think that these qualities of it um, suited the story so much. And so I used that to inform this work. And then you play it for them and they can hear those connections and it sort of um, launches you towards success and not towards kind of nebulous feeling in the dark. So that, that cool. is an aspect of it. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah, so it sounds like along with organization, communication is probably one of the best tools as well, right? Yeah. Awesome, cool. So we have a couple more we'll go through. Um, so this is a great question. This is kind of similar of like when you're sort of building the sound, trying to make something unique. What are your tips for avoiding cheesy sound design? I feel like a lot of podcasts I listen to sound the same. Do you think about that when you're working and how do you avoid it? Yeah. Um, so I, I think about it when I'm working. There are, pro there are projects I work, right now I'm working on a satire project where we're playing into that as much as we possibly can. Like that is exactly what we want. We want to reference all these things. So in that case, it serves the story perfectly and we're doing it on purpose. There are other times when it doesn't serve the story, um, which you're alluding to because it's most times. Um, I'd say in terms of avoiding cheesy sound design, um, I think there are two traps that people fall into. Uh, one is they only listen, they, they don't listen to a kind of diverse range of material. 
So their reference for what a podcast might sound like is only the three podcasts that they listen to. It's only, I mean, Amer This American Life has great score and great sound design, but it's a very specific aesthetic. And maybe that's the only thing that uh, the people making this other podcast have been exposed to. And so they're attempting to recreate that if they hadn't been exposed to anything else. And so I would encourage you um, not only to listen to other podcasts, but listen to all sorts of things. Maybe, maybe um, uh, French impressionist composers can influence the sound of your podcast. Maybe um, the sound of your morning walk through uh, through the, the beach can influence it. Maybe um, your favorite art films can. It you know it doesn't matter. But I think I think reaching outside of just like talky podcast stuff um, can open you to a world of different ways to use sound. And then the other thing is, you know, I mentioned um, the Free Music Archive, which is a great resource, but it's a resource that a lot of people depend on. And I, I think that is uh, one reason why a lot of podcasts sound the same is because often they're drawing from the same music or at, at least the same quality of the music. Um, and so I think thinking hard about what kind of music can serve your story and um, escaping this mentality of neutral music, which there's no such thing as neutral music, I think. Um, and, you know, reaching for maybe territory that's like a little bit more, um, a little less safe, maybe, uh, but in an informed way might, might help to shape that as well. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Great answer. Um, so we got a couple more. Um, so the next one, basically asking about uh, training your ear, tuning your ear um to understand sound design so basically um do you have any tips on how one might go about starting to build up some of that awareness sensitivity to sound kind of train your ear to yeah, yeah. Basically understand the process great question um I, so there, there are kind of two ways that you can think about it there's training your ear in a kind of creative sense and training your ear in a technical sense so on the creative end uh, the number one thing I can recommend, and we'll we'll share a link of, with this, but that those exercises, a sound education, by um, R. Murray Schaefer, yeah. R. Murray Schaefer, um, are an amazing way to go out into the world and be really conscious about what's happening in the soundscapes around you, and and kind of take note of them. So I highly recommend it. It's it's really really cool. Um, but even, even without that, just having a conscious mentality of stopping and really listening and not taking sound for granted, whether it's in your favorite movie or on your walk in the park, um, is kind of kind of all you need to do. Recording those sounds can be a really good way to focus in, because then you have to focus on being quiet so you don't influence the recording and you start to notice way more things if you're capturing it. Um, on the technical end of, of things, they're... they're is a degree of ear training that can be really helpful in that sound is made up of different frequencies. There's low frequencies and high frequencies and every sound is made up of different components of those frequencies. So much in the same way that a musician might train their ear, ear to hear different pitches, um, some sound engineers train their ears in a very conscious way to hear different frequencies so that they can identify problems in those frequencies and then remove them with the cue. And so I don't have um, a recommendation for a specific uh, tool or platform that does that, but if you search uh, ear training for sound engineers or pre like um, identifying frequencies, those kinds of topics, you'll find it. You can also do that just through practice of listening to a lot of dialogue and experimenting with it. So whether, whether it's through experience or through a kind of curriculum, it kind of um, can be either. Perfect, cool, thank you very much, super helpful. Um, all right, so we have another one. So asking about uh, what are the various elements of sound design of a podcast? So often theme, intro music, um, but what else do we need for a complete uh, design set, like ad breaks or anything like that? So yeah, if, if uh, we were collaborating together and you asked me that question, uh, the first thing I'd ask is, you know, I, so there's no one answer that I can give you because a podcast is just a vessel for a story. So I would ask what, what stories are you telling? Um, does the podcast con consistently use a uh, consistent structure to tell those stories that you want to highlight and get your listeners familiar with? So like you mentioned indicating an ad break. So perhaps your podcast is very structured and it always starts with um, 
an explainer about a topic just with a host and then a two-way interview after the break. And so you might um, create a kind of consistent language of uh, music that always plays before an ad break, for instance, or, or maybe there's sort of a sonic ID or a logo that you associate with your show. Um, but ultimate, I mean, ultimately the answer is <laughs> it's kind of, kind of up to you to, to decide and to design. Um, and it could be anything as long as you're making conscious choices that, you know, establishing like this will always highlight our structure in this way, or we'll always, you know, what, one thing, um, I like to think about, and this might help you think through this, is rather than thinking about what sounds do I need to design, um, maybe think about uh, structure in that, think about what, um, what rules can I set up that will guide the sounds that I put in my show. So rather than saying, oh, I, I am going to design 10 sounds, and those are going to be the sounds of my show, and they could be anything, um, that could be a pretty overwhelming design experience. And so instead you might think, oh, what rules can I establish that will guide the sounds that I choose and reinforce the story that I'm trying to tell? So maybe um, your podcast tells um, only stories of um, longshoremen from the 1950s. And so maybe you decide, okay, I'm only going to use um, musical examples with lyrics that are related to water in some way, and that's going to be a rule of my show. And maybe if there are sounds that punctuate the beginning and end of show, I'm going to reference um, the shipping container, which changed world shipping in 1957, I think. Um, and so I'm only going to use big metal sounds. So, you know, it could be anything, but just establishing a few rules, and then the sounds could be anything within that. So. I, maybe that's the answer to, to your question. Cool. Awesome. All really helpful answers. So thank you very much. Yes, but thank you all for joining us. Um, don't forget there are more Art of Podcasting workshops coming up. Um, if you would like to continue the conversation, have more questions about today, um, feel free to join our Discord. And don't forget to check out our blog. That's where you'll find the recordings um, and all the extended play workshops. Uh, so you can always go back and check them out. And I'm going to drop some links in the chat right now. So you just have that for reference. Um, we hope to see you again. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy.